Welcome to Film Theory Part 2, Experimental Filmmaking. First off, the term experimental filmmaking is a bit of a misnomer. You wouldn't call a painter an experimental painter, or a poet an experimental poet, would you? Experimental film is closer to painting and poetry than drama and theater. It is a light sculpture in time. Other terms like underground filmmaking, avant-garde films, and fine art films are all attempts to apply language to something looking to devoid itself of language. For practical purposes, I will use the term experimental filmmaking when referring to this form of expression. It is my dream to help bridge this gap of narrative and experimental film and share information that is becoming less and less relevant in this age of commercial films, yet more and more critical in exploring and discovering ourselves in the nature of reality and beauty. Now, you won't get rich making experimental films. If you do, it's when you're old and falling apart and have your films exhibited in museums. But you'll definitely get rich in another way that is possibly even more valuable. Let's get into it. People are addicted to distractions and media content. You can view it in three broad categories. Distractions, which is the lowest form of engagement, entertainment, and then art being the highest form of engagement. Experimental film lands in the third category and has its roots in surrealism and absolute cinema, a form of cinema that works with purely graphic, rhythmic, light, and color elements, focusing on the film's plasticity rather than photographic realism. Techniques like cutout and collage animations, pixelation, rotoscoping, scratching, painting, and directly drawing on the film. Later in the video, I'll show some techniques and principles you can use as a starting point, and we'll go out and make a short experimental film together. Getting back on track. Coming out of World War II, post-war experimental films ventured into the poetic explorations of consciousness, time, and space. Single authorship started to be a thing due to the ubiquity of small gauge format cameras like 8 and 16 millimeter. This is still a big deal. Today you can make an experimental film and explore this aesthetic by yourself and not need a 20 person crew, financiers, and some decision council that takes away from your intent and vision. With writers, they just need to buy a pen and some paper. Painters just really need the canvas, paints, and brushes. This accessibility to small cameras contributed to the lone wolf approach to experimental filmmaking and gives the filmmaker a great sense of autonomy. I've shot on Bolexes before and if the channel makes enough money, I'll buy one. But for now, I just love shooting on my iPhone. It is always in my pocket and it's the camera of our generation to be honest and is easily available. I love this idea. The quality of the image is too sharp for my taste, so extra effort needs to be taken when shooting on it. But that can mostly be solved. Right now, as a society, we are straddling the analog and digital realms, going from celluloid film to digital film. As a culture, we are going from analog to digital as well. Both are important, yet their qualities are different. Both need to coexist and take from one another. As an artist, it's all about having full control and autonomy. A lot of camera formats can give you this autonomy, though some others like the iPhone need extra effort in order to establish this. Some engineer in Apple Valley or wherever the hell in California has a hand in your work when shooting on, let's say, an iPhone. Their algorithms are the ones determining the color balance, focus, shutter, ISO, aperture, and overall quality. You can regain a bunch of this control with iPhone apps like Beast Cam and Filmic Pro. I don't make money off this. What's important is it will put more control in your pocket and maintain your artistic autonomy. Some filmmakers purposely utilize algorithms in their films and rely on them to help form their ideas. 
some pieces are totally made out algorithmically, while some others tango and dance with them in order to form their work. Let's listen to this quick clip by filmmaker Kave Zahidi from Richard Linklider's A Waking Life. For Bazin, what the ontology of film has to do is has to do with, you know, really with, with photography also has an ontology of, right. except that it has this dimension of time to it, you right. know, and like this greater realism. And so like, it's about that guy at that moment in that space. And, and you know, Bazin is like a Christian. So he like believes that, you know, in God obviously, and that like everything, he believes for him reality and God are the same, you know, like, and so what film is actually capturing is like God incarnate, creating, you know, and like this very moment, like, you know, um, God is manifesting as this. And what the film would capture if it was filming us right now would be like God as this table and God as you and God as me and God looking the way we look right now and saying and thinking what we're thinking right now because that is, you know, we are all God manifest in that sense. Mm -hmm. So film is actually like a record of God or of the face of God or of the ever-changing face of God. Celluloid film is a chemical process, exposing light to sensitive emulsion layers, producing random and unique grain structures when you look super close with an ineffable quality. Digital film is stored on magnetized hard disks made of glass, aluminum, or ceramic, in ones and zeros or ons and offs. Celluloid channels chemical energy, while digital channels electrical energy. Neither is better than the other, and represent different ways to store information and memory. There are a lot of experimental filmmakers who refuse to let their work be shown in any other way besides on celluloid film. There are some staunch holdouts, but others embraced digital early on and started to have fun with it. Some contemporary filmmakers investigate digital glitch aesthetics in video games. The point is not to choose one path or the other, but to understand that both mediums offer distinct opportunities for experimentation. Let's just quickly think about how we view images. So the way light enters our eyes is totally different from analog to digital. For analog films, you have the projector, of course, and it's humming along in the back of the theater. However, the light is bouncing off the screen and into your eyes and processed by our brains. This is the way we see naturally. Light bounces off a surface and into our eyes and we see color and form this way. Nowadays, the light is emitted directly from the screen straight into our eyes. By our phones, computer screens, iPads, whatever. It's a subtle difference that provides a different level of intensity. You can still see projected digital films, of course, but the reality is most of our viewing nowadays is from a screen emitting light directly at us instead of with the gentle, soft qualities of bounced light, which is more akin to whatever objective reality is. As humanity evolves and continues to shape its definition of reality and identity, the digital realm will become more and more integral in our interpretations. Some say we're already cyborgs who have already integrated significantly enough with machines via our devices and technology to no longer be called human, but possibly transhuman or posthuman. Are human beings not biological machines in themselves, governed by the same laws of nature as our Roombas or anything else in this universe? Is there room for freedom in a deterministic framework of natural laws? Does quantum mechanics show we live in a probabilistic, not a deterministic universe? Can we integrate the two? What is your view? Researchers are still discovering how our neurons store information. Think about the neurons in the brain. They have to communicate with each other in order to exchange information. And they do this at specialized connections called synapses. Though neurons appear analog in character in their sending of pulses of electrical signals, the information encoded in these signals can be treated as discrete, similar to how digital computers use memory. Okay, before we go outside and have some fun shooting together and show you some simple techniques you can do right away, we got to quickly cover some other basics and share a disclaimer about my artistic bias. Most of my experimental film upbringing was greatly influenced by the work of Nathaniel Dorsky and Bruce Bailey. All across the world are different communities and scenes of experimental filmmakers that explore all types of ideas, styles, and aesthetics. No one is better than the other. 
they all help distinguish each other. Coming out of San Francisco, I'm kind of an extension of the experimental scene that grew out of there over the last 50 years. You'll hear me covering Dorsky a lot because he is one of my influences. There are so many great filmmakers exploring different avenues, from the surrealist films of Darren, to the homoerotic occult films of Anger, to the hand-painted films of Brackage, and found footage films of Connor and others. There is a huge range. Finding, developing, and exploring your own style and influences is one of the really fun parts. To me, Dorsky's work is just a must-see for experimental filmmakers starting out. He films on a Bullex with 16mm film at 18 frames per second. This lower frame rate, he says, provides more detail and makes it more gentle. He views experimental film as having a devotional quality, whereas you can have the same spiritual experience offered by religion through the exploration of experimental film. I'm going to quickly introduce you to some key concepts, but honestly don't want to define them for you because it puts limitations on it. The avenues to explore as an experimental filmmaker are space versus time, lyrical versus structural, optics, texture, color, material, and technique. It is helpful to form these ideas into questions when watching a film. For example, how is this piece using space, time, optics, or texture? What techniques can I identify? These are just some of the building blocks. A lot of pieces don't use sound in order to put more stress on the image, but explore sound as well, obviously. One last thing. Experimental films can be ironic and funny. They don't need to be weighty, uptight mantle pieces wrapped in profundity. I like both, but whatever. Okay, let's go outside. All right, uh, this is everything I carry with me for right now. Uh, you can see there's a lot of glass, um, plastics. I got some tape. I got uh, a pack of cine gels here. This is really nice, and you can pick this up free at your local camera store. So these are fantastic. Definitely bring these with you because they have, you know, all of these different colors and filters that you can play with, and this is really a key piece. Um, but maybe even more important than this are the glass. Um, these are fantastic because uh, for example, this one here is like currently one of my favorites. I think uh, this picked it up from Costco. They sell it in like 20 packs, but it's textured glass. And if we just like put it up to the lens really quick, you could see, you know, it gives a really nice, really nice texture to it. And uh, you'll, you'll pretty much see, if you go to like a local Goodwill or Salvation Army or like used store, um, Check out their glass. Old glass uh, is really interesting and unique, um, especially if it has textures or patterns on it. And you can pretty much tell who the experimental filmmakers are by uh, the people uh, looking at the glass through the light. So this right here is personally my favorite piece of glass. Um, that being said though, you can find other types of glass. Um, here I picked this up from Amazon. Uh, a couple years ago, and this one's nice too. It's just, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, so it has a nice quality to it. And moves the light in their interesting ways. And then um, for something that, uh, you know, always have something really simple, it's just a simple piece of glass. Uh, I carry around this one with me, and this is nice too. It gives you different types of, you know, play around with it. Uh, as you can tell, the glass I carry with me is pretty small. And that's because uh, you got to hold the camera. I personally shoot on an iPhone. That's what I'm exploring right now is just making an experimental film solely using the iPhone. Like I said earlier in the video, I really think the iPhone is a camera of our generation. So I know it's digital, but um, it's representative of 
what we have accessibility to and as an experimental filmmaker or artist in general accessibility in my opinion is really important so currently everything um, all my experimental films I do now are via the iPhone and we'll get into ways a little bit later on uh, on to like how to combat um, you know pixel quality and grain especially shooting at nighttime iPhones are pretty horrible uh, ways to uh, give you more autonomy and full control because right now it's it's auto focus it's uh, auto color correction auto shutter ISO everything so really it's like some engineer like I said in California is the one like making your artistic decisions for you but you know for being practical for this I mean obviously it's like okay yeah I'm not you know sometimes I'll relinquish that for very practical reasons but uh, ultimately you want to maintain autonomy and full control and we'll get into um, beast cam app and I'll show you how you could use all of the features in there to give you as much autonomy as freaking possible on an iPhone but uh, moving on um, I also have a little mirror a little pocket mirror here uh, this is really useful uh, for obvious reasons um, moving on as well we have uh, just a Ziploc bag here I love bringing things along with me that have double triple purposes it's a bag you know also a texture as well you know it gives you some texture not too bad and you can explore with all this stuff like with the glass for example explore with like amber glass tinted glass colored glass uh, you could bring uh, watercolors or paints with you you can paint on the glass uh, chip it away uh, explore with layering up plastic on glass or your filters on plastic filters on glass paint with glass and filters or it just goes on and on there's really it's like infinite possibilities but uh, this plastic bag you know these are just all simple items and simple the better in my opinion so we got this bag here I also use this for potentially uh, putting in items that I want to uh, keep together or whatnot a simple way to do that uh, the gels of course a sample pack um, already covered that the tape is for the gels um, to tape the gels on the front of the lens if you need it to. I try not to do that because I don't want to have to get another one of these. I actually haven't found another one of these. I mean, I've had this pack for, I don't know, half a decade, so it's kind of like means, I don't know, it has sentimental value to me, so I want to keep this intact. So usually I would just like flip out. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, usually I just flip out, let's say, uh, whatever color I want to use. Let's say it's um, blue. All right. And, uh, yeah, let me just hold it up to the gel like that and give you a nice tint. Yeah. So I try to do it like that, but we only have two hands. So sometimes you need to tape this on, hold the camera with one hand, or maybe you have the camera on sticks or monopod. But there's, uh, yeah. Uh, cine gels, tape. This I usually don't carry with me, but uh, for the purposes of this video, um, I decided to bring a Sharpie along with me, and uh, you'll figure out why later. You know, I know some of you are already thinking, like, you can draw on the glass. Yes, yes, we can draw on the glass, and that's actually a really good idea. Uh, Granted, it's a Sharpie, maybe like something that's less permanent would be better. Um, or maybe draw on the plastic bag. We'll, we'll pl play around. We'll, we're going to play around later. I don't even know what we're going to do yet. I mean, this is my first unscripted video I've ever posted on YouTube. So it was it's completely just of the moment. We're just going to cover whatever. I don't have no idea what we're going to make, but we're going to make something. 
and learn something, hopefully, along the way. Uh, I got a spoon here. Spoon's pretty nice. It's a different quality of, uh, you know, got scratches in it. Play around with that a little bit. Really simple, really lightweight, really small tool. And then um, I usually don't carry this with me, but um, I just have a uh, paper here. And you'll see uh, shortly why I brought along the paper. Oh, uh, one more item. Almost forgot. So uh, with the glass, um, you know, we, the glass is really important. Like if you find a good piece of glass, just keep it for your whole life. But uh, aside from glass, you can use like plastics and uh, that have liquids in it of like different colors and whatnot. And, you know, it'll provide different quality. I mean, the text on it is sucky, but if you find the right angle and enough light, uh, it will give you some very interesting uh, qualities to it. So this I just brought with us. Um, I haven't gotten super deep into using colored oils and stuff right now. I'm not even there yet, in my opinion. Like, I still have to, like, I'm not done exploring just these, you know, basic items. So I'll eventually get to this. Um, I've used it in some, some of my films. Um, if you look at my Instagram is uh, Mythical Pigeon TV. I think I got like five or six short experimental films up there. One of them is utilizing this piece in particular. And uh, this piece of glass was the first glass I was playing around with. Um, but this one right now is my like current favorite. And uh, you can also put water inside your glass and it will refract the light in very unique and interesting ways and give it kind of a liquid quality and it's just really pretty uh so okay let's get back in and let's just shoot something really really simple i saw some pretty flowers up along the way um and we're, we're, i'm trying to find an area that has like good dynamic lighting which is basically uh, with the wind moving the, the branches and you get the shadows moving and get a little bit right now. And it's just really, really nice. So, wow, okay, we got a little bit lucky. Got the wind coming through. So yeah, just looking for dynamic lighting. Personally, I like that. Movement is interest, um, but okay. Let's go and film. I just walked to the other side of the park. I noticed these uh, morning glories um, earlier and th thought they were really pretty. And uh, we all like taking pictures of flowers. And it's very easy. They're just stunningly beautiful by themselves. But uh, we're going to abstract it a little bit and uh, make it our own. And just, uh, just experiment. Typically, you know, photographers or filmmakers typically say, um, I take pictures because I want to know what they look like. And that's exactly what we're going to do. And uh, we're going to use our intuition for this. Don't try to overthink it too much. Use your gut feeling. And uh, what's nice is we got a little bit of a breeze. So we're getting some movement here, which is uh, I always try to find just uh, gives uh, the plants more, a little bit more life. But the first thing we got to do before we even like know, okay, what we want to film is we have to know what the sun is doing. It's about 9.30 a.m. in the morning right now. It's a clear day. I'm not going to turn the camera to the sun, but it's, it's beaming down. It's pretty hot. We don't have diffusion from, from the clouds. The shadows are going to be a little bit more contrasty and whatnot, which is okay. You know, just we have this in the back of our, our mind while we're filming. So first thing I do is uh, intuitively right now, like I wouldn't mind looking at them from this piece of glass. So 
Let's just see what we can get. And right now I'm not using the Beast Cam app. I'm just experimenting with like different glass on the flowers because uh, when you, we go into Beast Cam app and, and you'll see like it puts the interface on and all of the controls and stuff like that. And like when we find our shot, okay, then we'll go into Beast Cam app and get it. So that one I didn't quite like and some, but, you know, some people might like it. But uh, let's see here. This one's not too shabby. This one has potential. Let's see what our plastic looks like. And rule of thumb for experimental filmmaking is get closer. Get closer. It's a nice quality to it. And usually just hold on a still shot for 10 seconds or so. Because you really don't know what you're going to get. Play with angles and whatnot. We'll eventually get there. I just saw some bees fly over here. So we're going to just get that really quick. The macro capabilities of the iPhone are actually pretty freaking good. Okay, so let's move on. Just playing around. Let's bring out our gels here. This is way more difficult than usual because usually I don't have to be filming while flipping through all, all of our all of my tools. Uh not that. One second. Pulled out the, the red filter and let's see what it looks like. Hmm. It's a nice quality to it. I like this one a lot actually. Brings out the pinks. It's not too shabby. I'm just going to, we're just going to hold on here for a little bit. Yeah, you notice my hand has slight tremor to it, so I have it, my elbow now propped up on my knee to reduce the tremors. If we were in Beast Cam app right now, they have a stabilizer, so we don't need to worry about that, but because we're just kind of in the moment here and the this came up, we're just going to get what we can, take as much as we can. Okay. All right, got the uh, green filter out. Um, let's uh, see what green looks like. We're just gonna hold here for a little bit. Got tangent in the lower right. We'll zoom in the video later a little bit to take that out if we wanna use this shot. But uh, yeah, l l let me know, you know, what you like and don't like here, what works for you. I kind of like the red filter more. Brought out those pinks, but this one's still nice too. Alrighty. We got the Beast Cam app open now. Uh, really nice, you can see on the bottom, we got uh, all of our different controls. We got our ISO here. We got our shutter, which is a little bit insane right now. And then we got some uh, brightness controls right here. So it, it's not everything you would get off of a DSLR or film camera, obviously, but it's the best we can do for right now, uh, what's available. So at least there's like some control given. But uh, one of my favorite things about this app is um, the image sta stabilization right here. We have some different types. You can see it adjusts the stabilization in different ways. So this is just normal right here. See, you can see like trying to keep it still. You still got that slight tremor. So this is really nice. It just takes that away. So this is one of my favorite parts about this. Then of course we can put on our guides, our rule of thirds here, you know, different guides and lines and whatnot. Um, aspect ratio. 
Um, shows different aspect ratios here, which is nice depending uh, what aspect you want to film in. Now, it won't export in these a aspect ratios. It's more like, okay, just showing you uh, what it would look like. Uh, come down here. I usually don't have like all of these overlays on, but uh, I just want to show everyone watching. Our frame rates, um, 24 is great. That's what I usually use. I wish they had something lower. Um, I messaged them earlier and uh, asked them if they had maybe a 16 or 18 uh, Dorsky, you know, films at a lower frame rate. So it'd be nice to, you know, try to get as close to what maybe he does if you want to kind of try to, you know, get as close there. I mean, there's like no way to like mimic, you know, a Dorsky film filming off of iPhone. It's like, if you do, please send it to me and let me know. I mean, and by the way, if anyone out there, uh, please comment below if you're a filmmaker or artist yourself and you have interesting ideas for how to get really unique, cool shots, abstract and representative stuff. And um, I'm always open to new ideas, so please comment down below. Uh, and then we have, uh, down here, we have our um, video outputs. So it can go up, up, up to 4K. Um, I typically do 1920 by 1080. Um, that's good enough for me. I just do so much uh, filming. I, I just like, don't have the space on my iPhone to have 4K stuff. And it's just like way too crisp and sharp for me personally. Um, it's really great though. I mean, for a lot of photographers, if you want that like additional realism or whatnot. So here are some of the options we have. Yeah, 3840 by 2160. Yeah, that's, that's insane. And we're getting that from our phones. I mean, that's wild. So we got our uh, camera light here. Torch. You can adjust that. And then the microphone, you can do sound through here too, which is nice. Right now I have it muted. But uh, this is the basics of it right now. So imagine using, you got Beast Cam app, you got your filters, you got your glass, you got your tools. And very well, you don't even need any tools or filters or glass or glass to abstract an image. I mean, very simply, I mean, you can just flip the phone upside down, excuse me for anyone um, sensitive to motion and that abstracts it by itself or just making it black and white is an immediate abstraction of the image so you can get really really fancy and layer up a bunch of tools and whatnot flipping back over um get really fancy and layer up a, a bunch of you know glass and filters and you got the paint etched on it you got water and maybe some oil in there you put some sparkles in there and it's just like a fireworks show. I mean, that's fantastic and great. That's like one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is just allowing for the object or environment to exist for what it is. And Dorsky talks about finding the middle ground between that, where you're not getting too symbolic on one end and on the other end, you're just allowing for the object or environment, your subject, just to exist for who, what, it, they are. So I am uh, still consider myself a novice. My journey is gonna be a lifelong journey and I'm just trying to play around with like the basics right now. All right, my uh, phone was overheating because I had the screen recording going beast cam going and it's freaking hot out here so i had to just pause really quickly but i uh, wanted to get a shot with the filter through the glass it's difficult to hold this position but i wanted to show you what a filter through the glass looked like and see it causes a little bit nice distortion upper left is kind of undesirable but for right now i can't do anything about it and we'll just use that in the film it's a part of what we're taking here. So there we go. 
So now we got um, some textures on our uh, plastic bag now that we could use. A little uh, dot pattern, some stripes. Uh, let's see how it looks like really quick. Kind of interesting. The focus is, is difficult because it's trying to focus on the bag and whatnot, but it does create like a certain type of softness to it, so it's not too bad. Yeah, this, definitely trying to focus on that a little bit too much. So we'll just flip it around. All right, yeah, interesting quality. The, the focus is a big issue when it comes to uh, filming on the iPhone. Um, Beast Cam app does not do have a uh, manual focus. There is another app, which I'm gonna explore soon. It's called uh, Filmic Pro. Um, it does have manual focus, so you can do focus pulling on that. Um, probably the most famous feature film uh, shot on the iPhone using that app, Filmic Pro, was a tangerine shot in uh, 2015 by uh, director Sean Baker. And uh, it was nominated at Sundance and got a whole bunch of awards and accolades and whatnot. And I uh, highly recommended to watch that film. I think they shot it on uh, five iPhones. And they're, they were like older generation iPhones too, like I, iPhone 3s or 5s maybe? I, I think it was uh, I, iPhone 3s. Well, let me know in the comments uh, if you know. But uh, came back today, wanted to pick up some additional shots and uh, wanted to also quickly cover... Um, I mean, he, he's like one of the most influential photographers of all time. And, you know, I'm sure most people have heard of his name, but it's Ansel Adams. And uh, he really transcended uh, photography and what it did mean to people. Because before it was like, oh, okay, photographers, not artists. They're, they're taking snapshots, blah, blah, blah. And he totally turned that upside down with... Um, coming up with the idea of not only the zone system, which we'll get into, but um, the concept of pre-visualization -visual or previs, which is essentially um, the photographer or artist has the idea of a shot in their mind's eye before they take the shot and then they go out and kind of hunt for that shot down. Like Ansel Adams was a complete badass uh, to say the least. He, he would He's known as a nature photographer. He went around the United States to all the national parks and took uh, pictures of uh, beautiful vistas or just uh, uh, simple shots of plants and whatnot. But uh, pre visiting was like a big idea. And he would look at, let's say, a vista and imagine the ideal cloud coverage and lighting and weather and also... Uh, <clears throat> values across a kind of grid overlay system across the image and he offend, he essentially invented HDR photography so he would take uh, a bunch of exposures and then take the best parts of those exposure and create one image out of it um, balancing out you know the the, <clears throat> the blacks and whites so I just wanted to cover that really quickly. I felt like, okay, this is important to cover um, for a video like this. So uh, let's, let's pick up a, a couple more shots. First, I just want to try our uh, plastic bag with the uh, dot pattern on it. And I think a good idea too is like there might be too much, uh, because it's like a bag, there's two layers of plastic. Um, I might have to rip off one, one half of the bag. So it's just one layer of plastic looking through. Um, to just reduce the softness and uh, focus problems. But uh, let's just look at what it, what it looks like as is for right now. Definitely has a really nice soft and gentle quality to it. I mean, it's not too shabby. Oh, that's very nice of you, Mr. B. You know, abstraction, pretty nice. I do have the... Uh, 
motion stabilizer on. You know, like I said, it's my favorite feature on the phone right now. I'm uh, crisscross applesauce on the ground. Okay, this isn't too shabby. I wouldn't mind using uh, that pink filter we had earlier with the bag. Um, it's definitely going to be a juggling act. I realize like I definitely need to carry around a tripod with me. I've never done that before when shooting my experimental films. Uh, but now realizing that, okay, it's essentially a third hand, so I'll definitely need that. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get the um, filter and plastic bag and glass. It, it's just going to be like a little bit too much. I will attempt it, I think. I think it would be kind of funny. Oh, this actually turned out a little bit better than expected. Yeah, the, the softness, yeah, it was a little bit too soft. Definitely uh, going to probably rip this plastic bag in half and uh, see what that looks like. Um, didn't bring scissors with me because I don't, I don't want to bring anything people could possibly construe as a weapon, basically. So uh, let me uh, j just rip this plastic bag really quickly in half, and then we'll take a look at the dot pattern and uh, these uh, stripes again. I just tore the plastic bag along the seams and uh, yeah, this is actually a way better quality. Definitely like this a lot more. There's just a little bit too much, much softness and uh, obscurity um, through the uh, double layer plastic. So yeah, this is actually a lot nicer. Yeah, this isn't too bad. Definitely like that. Definitely like that. All right, let's uh, take a look at our stripes. Trying to keep the bag straight, but okay, this actually turned out pretty nice. Um, definitely like this. This isn't too shabby. Still wouldn't mind that pink filter. I just don't know if we'll be able to get it today. Um, I mean, I think these flowers will still be here in this next month, so we'll come back with our pink filters and uh, see what it looks like. But. Uh, yeah, this is not that bad. Actually, at first I liked the dots more than the stripes, and now it's like, okay, I kind of like the stripes more than the dots. All right. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try pink filter with the plastic bag uh, through the stripes and, and the dots. And uh, if we're feeling crazy, uh, we'll just, we'll do glass plastic, uh, we'll do glass plastic bag uh, <laughs> in the pink filter. Yeah, I don't know exactly. Okay, so it was really like a magenta filter, so pulling that out now. Let's just uh, review what we got here. So let's see, I think this was the same type. There's the same type. Yeah, yeah, this looks right here. Yeah, yeah this is a really nice filter on these flowers. Okay. All right, that's what that looks like. Now we're gonna go for plastic bag through the filter. We're gonna see what this looks like. Okay. Yeah, as you layer up more layers, I mean, the, the autofocus just has given us more issues, though um, if we understand that, we can use it to make our choices with it, even though it is autofocus, and we play around with it long enough where, okay, we get the focus to, like, where we want it, and we work within our limitations. Kind of interesting. Uh, the stripes kind of fade away a little bit with uh, the pink filter now on there but also there's a little bit more space between uh, the filter and the bag so maybe it needs to be like layer on layer so excuse me and try that really quick and once again like this is like when it's like kind of ideal to have a couple of these cine gels so you could just cut off uh, what you're trying to use but uh, 
Yeah, we're going to try this for comical reasons. Holy. Yeah, I, I've gotten a lot of people come up to me and ask me if I was drunk or if I'm having like a nervous breakdown or like some type of psychological issues while making my experimental films. And I actually take that as a compliment because it means you're doing something right. And if somebody does say that to you on whatever shot you're working on, uh, say, oh, no, I'm, I'm just a filmmaker. And then, you know, spend a little bit extra time at that location. You know, if somebody thinks you're, you're, you're crazy, um, that's actually a compliment. So, okay. So I, I, I try to get the uh, filter closer to the uh, stripe pattern on the plastic bag. Don't see the stripes quite as well. I think it really needs to be up against a plastic bag. There is like maybe a um, two millimeter gap between the filter and the plastic bag, and maybe uh, six millimeters between the lens and the filter. So there's like these little pockets of space in between. So that makes it, it provides its own quality, but it's also, you know, not really getting what we want. So I'll probably, if I really wanted to get the shot the way I wanted to, I would have to get another, I would have to cut out the filter, tape it directly onto the plastic bag, and then tape that. Actually, no, I wouldn't tape that to the camera, but I would just have it in front of the uh, lens. This still isn't, like, too shabby. All right, let's try uh, a different filter. Okay, I brought out the uh, purple filter. This was my uh, second favorite after the pink filter. Uh, I think like for the last shot, we were just layering up too much stuff and it, it just kind of takes away from, uh, you know, the, the flower itself, which is like what we're trying to capture. And it, it's kind of like going too far to one edge and kind of like bring it back, you know, as I say, the uh, virtue is in the middle. So I try to find that balance. And it's, you know, it's really fun to explore like both ends of the spectrum here. And actually what I'm probably going to do is uh, try to find some more of these cine gel packs and then draw the dot pattern directly onto the gels. And I think that will provide uh, a more interesting image of my liking. The plastic bag creates that more softness and uh, kind of gentle quality and human quality that kind of Dorsky talks about. Yet, um, takes away from the flower itself, which didn't really want to do, but we are exploring, so it's not like there's any wrong choices here. You know, this is how we learn and figure it out. Yeah, definitely this purple filter's not bad. Alrighty, fantastic. Uh, let's move on. All right, uh, I try to get focus on the flower really quick. We'll expose for the flower. Um, I think I need to get a larger mirror. This pocket mirror has uh, been good though, but um, this style, if you've seen a or uh, his type of films, you'll be like, okay, you know, the, this guy is like obviously a fan of Dorsky, but uh, Dorsky is, you know, it's kind of like my first base. Um, and to be honest, he, he's not even really, uh, we're not even at first base yet. We're, we're just trying to lay down a bunt right now. And, uh, home plate is, uh, something else completely. I mean, to be honest, uh, I like, uh, the work of, uh, Maya Darren, um, a little bit more than, uh, Dorsky's work. And, uh, even, uh, Peter Tesher Kase who uh, solely uses found footage to uh, create a new film space. And uh, they might be like my second or third base. And, uh, you know, it, you could have a hundred bases. And I, I never expect to reach home plate in my lifetime. And I actually rather not reach whatever, quote unquote, I consider to be home plate. Um, just keep adding bases. So I'm not even at first base yet. Uh, just laying down a bunt. I decided to bring um, some additional objects with us to kind of toss in the flowers a little bit, be a little bit ir irreverent to the flowers um, and show that there's a side of experimental filmmaking that doesn't need to be like this 
this like meditative, super respectful of the object or subject you're filming of. And uh, so I brought along a couple of additional, um, I guess, props with us. So I brought some heels here. Um, these are not mine. I borrowed these from uh, my brother's girlfriend. But uh, yeah, it's for some reason when I was uh, filming in uh, SF in uh, other cities, sometimes I would see heels like just thrown on the side of the street and I always thought like, how, how did they get there? And it was like, seemed like such an interesting story was behind it and it really provoked a lot of thought and uh, sometimes when I'll be late at night um, like I said there's a lot of interesting uh, people uh, on the streets and they're not all dangerous people or whatnot you know they're just normal people and uh, sometimes I would see uh, ladies barefoot and uh, they're you know they're like don't have their shoes on and they're like crying in you know like 2 a.m. in the morning and I always wondered like what happened to them and sometimes um, so, sometimes I, I, I would talk to, to them and whatnot, but, um, just to make sure they're, they're okay. But, um, <clears throat> uh, aside from, from that, it was just, uh, they're, they're just, to me, it was just always seemed like a story. So, I mean, so if something like that, I think is, uh, interesting. So we'll do, uh. We're going to take a couple of pictures of this and uh, kind of intercut it with just our flowers and whatnot. But I just want to show you can be like irreverent with um, with experimental films and whatnot. It doesn't need to be like this holy, like transcend. You know, well, it, it can. It, it's just really different. I mean, it's really hard to predict uh, what anything means to a certain person. So um, that's what. <clears throat> has made this film in particular difficult to make because I'm kind of straddling the line of, okay, I want to um, show people the basic rules while at the same time advising there are no rules. So, and that there's really a very wide spectrum of experimental films. So, here's what we shot together. I hope you liked it and had fun. If this video inspired you to make your own experimental films, I would love to see them. So please send me your link through my Instagram or Facebook. And uh, 
comment down below what apps and accessories on the iPhone you use to make your films with. Special thanks to Dr. Max Tolene, a film scholar and video essayist with a PhD in interdisciplinary arts who helped make this video possible. Please check out his YouTube channel AMT253 and his newly released film, A Supercut of Supercuts Aesthetics Histories Databases. Links also in the description below. For the time being, this wraps up the film theory series. Unless people happen to like these videos, then I'll add on to it as time goes by. I kind of want to do a motion picture language video to round out the series at least. So I'll do that sometime in the future, even if people didn't really like this series. Anyways, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. It is greatly appreciated. Get out there and get filming. Until I see you on the next one, have a great day.